the ghostly hand of Spital House. George Alderson owned the English inn called Spital House some 200 years ago. It perched high on Stainmore in Yorkshire's North Riding. What with iron bars at the windows, walls a foot thick and steep stone steps leading to the oak door, chained and bolted inside, Spital House looked more like a fortress than an inn. One stormy night in October, the innkeeper and his son Bob sat cleaning their hunting knives and firearms before the blazing logs of the hearth. Up here on the moors, a man must be prepared for everything, remarked George Alderson, rubbing the shining blade of a knife on his sleeve. Aye, the master is right, declared the little maidservant Bella, glancing from the pot she was stirring to Mistress Alderson, busy at her spinning wheel. Tis nights like this, when winds howl and the rains beat, that evil men crawl from their holes. George and Bob nodded. They always kept their weapons handy, for in those days highwaymen roamed the solitary region around Stainmore as well as honest men. Both coming and going, travelers by stage twixt York and Carlisle stopped off at the inn, for Spital House, though grim and forbidding outside, was cheerful and warm within, with a succulent joint usually turning on the spit of the hearth. Once a weary traveler had dried his boots and sipped a mug of steaming posset, Bella offered tasty soup from the pot, along with a radiant smile. A warm welcome and a good feather bed awaited folks at Spital House. Small wonder that fame of the old inn had spread the length and breadth of North England. Now, on that gale-whipped October night, George Alderson glanced around the comfortable room. The cheerful whir of the spinning wheel and the smell from Bella's pot made a man glad to sit by his hearth. We beat the storm by a good two hours, he remarked to his wife Margaret, and lucky we are to be home from the fair. What with wind coming up and rain pelting down, it's good to sit here warm and snug with our horses bedded down for the night. That it is, Bob agreed and grinned at his father. And it's good, too, to have our handsome profits for the sale of our sheep bedded down in the cupboard tonight. Mistress Alderson lifted her calmly head and smiled at her men. And, Bob continued, since this is the sort of night cutthroats and robbers take for plundering the moors, I'm thankful to have my blunderbuss cleaned, <laughs> should there be need to use it. Bella vigorously stirred her pot. Bob was right. This was a night to be careful. She, a country girl born and reared on Stainmore, knew more about cutthroats and robbers than her masters from York. She recalled many a story of stagecoaches robbed, horses stolen, and passengers murdered. As she thought of the dreadful dark deeds, Bella fancied she heard a faint knock at the door. Master, mistress, Bella cried, I think someone's at the door. Shall I open and see? I lass, the innkeeper said, though it seems late for a traveler to be battling this gale. As Bella ran to the door, Margaret Alderson paused at her work. Best leave the chain on, child, she said in a low voice, until you see who's there. As Bella turned the great key in the lock and slid back the heavy bolt, a feeble voice whispered, hurry, hurry. In heaven's name, let me in, lest I die on your doorstep. At a nod from her mistress, Bella dropped the clanking chain from the slot and peered cautiously at their storm-whipped visitor. Before her drooped a gaunt figure leaning on a stick, the hood of the cloak the stranger clutched completely hid the features, save for two dark, piercing eyes. Let me in, the feeble voice implored. Tis a wicked night for an old woman to wander the moors. Poor soul, Bella thought compassionately, supporting the stumbling stranger to the settle beside the hearth. It was addled she was from wandering around in the storm. A sip of brandy and a rest by the fire would do her a world of good. And yet, in spite of her concern for the bedraggled creature, the girl thought the body next hers was remarkably firm and the voice deep for an old woman. 
Their guest sank to the settle with a pitiful moan while George Alderson added a log to the fire. But when Bob sprang forward to remove the black cloak, dripping puddles on the floor, the aged woman waved him away. No, no, rasped the hoarse voice, muffled within the folds of the hood. I want nothing but to sit here by the fire before I go on my way. Rest is all my old body needs. The poor soul was quite daft, Bella concluded. Only a witless person would forsake the chimney corner to wander abroad tonight. George Alderson, convinced that their guest wanted nothing but a nap in the warmth of the fire, drew Mistress Margaret aside. It's late, he whispered. We might as well get to bed. The old one's mad, if you ask me. I wager a gold sovereign she'll be right here come morning. As the Aldersons lighted their upstairs candles, Bella said, I'd best keep an eye on the poor one. I'll sleep down here tonight and lock up afterwards if she decides to leave. Swishing at the ashes with her broom, Bella stole a quick glance at the motionless hooded figure. The old one was sleeping, the girl decided. It wasn't until Bella reached down for the bellows that her heart almost stopped beating. The toes of a man's heavy riding boots showed from under the hem of the long cloak the stranger clutched, even in sleep. This was no half-witted crone, but surely a robber disguised as an old woman. Bella knew that she must not make a false move, not with the Aldersons upstairs and herself alone with this fella. So she moved back and forth as usual, putting the room to rights. She set the milk to rise, then scoured the copper pot on the table. The figure on the settle moved restlessly. When do you go to bed, girl? The hoarse voice whispered. Right away, ma'am, Bella answered, untying her apron. Can I get you hot tea now that you've had your nap? Nay, nay, croaked the voice crossly. The hooded head turned away. Then if you want nothing, the girl said, I'll build up the fire and fix my bed. Nights like this, my room's cold, so I sleep on yonder bench where it's warm. The stranger grunted, but made no reply. Good night, ma'am, and rest well, Bella said sleepily from across the room. If, if you need aught, <laughs> call loudly, she added, for I'm a sound sleeper. <laughs> <laughs> that I am. Bella wrapped herself in her shawl and stretched out on the bench. Everything depended on her. Her own life and those of the Aldersons. In spite of the way she was trembling, she'd have to convince the outlaw that she was asleep. Yet watch what he did. At first, Bella tossed this way and that. But in a few minutes, she found that she could pretend to be asleep. All she had to do was count slowly, one, two, to breathe in, out, in, deeper and deeper, all the time. Bella narrowed her eyes to slits so she could observe the man on the settle. Possibly an hour passed before he stirred. Then, apparently satisfied Bella was asleep, he threw back his hood. By the flickering firelight, she saw a long, pale face with thin, cruel lips and eyes that glittered craftily. Without any warning, the ruffian suddenly strode across the room, then stood staring down at her face. If she betrayed herself now by so much as twitching an eyelid, he'd murder them all, forcing herself to repeat over and over in Bella found she could still pretend sleep. Only when convinced that the girl on the bench was asleep did the cutthroat return to the fire. There, from the folds of his cloak, Bella saw him draw forth an object so fearsome she had to stifle a scream in her throat. Her flesh crept with horror. For the awful shrunken thing the outlaw took from his garment and set on the table not far from the copper pot was old and withered, brown as earth from a newly dug grave. It was the severed hand of a man long dead. If 
the scoundrel had seen Bella's face at that moment, he'd have killed her at once. But fortunately, his back was toward her as he bent to light a candle by the fire. When he turned about, Bella managed to breathe more heavily than before. Glancing sharply at her face, the man thrust the candle into the half-open palm of the hand and began to chant what sounded like a magic spell. Lock those who sleep in slumber deep, and yet more deep, O oh, withered hand. Show us the spoil, direct your light to treasure bright. Help our waiting robber band, lead us to spoil this stormy night. When the words ceased, Bella took care not to slacken her breathing until she thought of a way to outwit the robber single-handed. She'd have to feign sleep. A blunder would cost all their lives. The crafty cutthroat began chanting again. Shine out, ghostly light, lead us, ghostly hand, reveal rich Treasure to our waiting band. The candle flickered brightly. It would point to the cupboard soon, Bella thought desperately, and show where the master had locked his money. Whatever she did, she must act quickly. But as the girl lay there, racking her brains for a way to warn the master, the man strode to the window. He pushed it open and gave a shrill whistle. So there were more cutthroats, and no telling how many Bella thought in panic as she heard the faint answering whistles outside. She must thwart the ruffian before the others got in. An instant later, Bella saw her chance. After shutting the window, the robber went to the door and turned the great key in the lock. As he swung the door open, Bella leapt at his back and gave him a thrust that sent him bumpity-bump down the steep stone steps that led to the door. Bella watched him collapse in a heap on the ground and lie still. Now the girl slammed the heavy door shut, turned the key in the iron lock, and slipped the huge bolts into the slots. Last of all, she secured the heavy chain. That will keep you and your friends outside, Bella muttered grimly. Wait till the master peppers your hides with his bullets. Master, come quickly, the girl shouted. But there was no answer. Perhaps they didn't hear me, Bella thought, and shouted again loudly as she could. Come at once, master. Bob, robbers are here. Robbers, I say. Can you hear me? She cried even more lustily. They're gathering outside. I, I hear their yells. But the louder Bella called, the more ominous was the silence overhead. And as to the horrible hand on the table, when she forced herself to take a quick glance at that, the candle was burning brightly, and now the flame pointed directly at the lock on the cupboard door. Master Alderson! Master Bob! Help! Help! Come! Come! Bella shouted, though by now she knew something dreadful had happened. Snatching a candle, she flew up the stairs, but when she held the light over the bed of the innkeeper and his wife, she found them sound asleep. The girl shook them and called out loudly. She even shouted into their ears, but she couldn't rouse the sleeping couple. Oh, dear heaven, what is that? Bella sobbed desperately, for by now the robbers were beating at the door. Bella ran to Bob's room, but the youth was sound asleep. It was only after she had doused his face with cold water, dragged him from bed by the feet, and still he slept, that she remembered the robber's spell. Lock those in sleep in slumber deep, and yet more deep. Evil magic, Bella exclaimed, anguished tears on her cheek. If I can't find a way to break the spell, we are lost. The robbers will kill us all. Without losing another moment, Bella darted for the stairs. 
she'd find a way, though she didn't know how to extinguish the candle and shatter the magic that locked her people in sleep. But to her horror, Bella found the candle burning brighter than ever in the withered hand, and the massive outside door shivered and shook under the robber's battering kicks. Dear heaven, help us, Bella sobbed. Frantically, her eyes searched the room. She must find something to put out the flame. Outside, the robbers bellowed, Let us in, witless one, if you know what's good for you. Open the door before we sliver it to kindling wood. And as for you... The voices muttered, threatening and low, If you don't open at once, we'll slice you up as you slice a mutton joint. And then... We'll chop you to mincemeat, roared another voice. One that Bella recognized as belonging to the ruffian she'd kicked outside. He'd come too. The girl shuddered as the voice continued. The others are sleeping a sleep from which they won't waken. They can't help you. Thump, bang, thud, crash. Bella blanched with terror as the furious blows made the copper pot on the table jump. The copper pot! Perhaps she could extinguish the candle with that. In desperation, Bella grabbed the pot and turned it over the candle and the dreaded, withered hand. Almost immediately, the candle spluttered, then sizzled and sighed. But the hand under the pot flopped so to hold it down took all of Bella's strength. Master, Bob, get up! The robbers are here! Bella shouted, but now there was no need to rouse the men, for almost before she'd opened her mouth, she heard running feet overhead. Then a window slammed, weapons rattled on the floor. Bella wept with relief. She'd broken the spell, but the hand still jumped and rattled under the kettle. You down there! Bella heard George Alderson thunder. Get gone! Get gone at once! Before every man finds a hole in his skull! Warning shots followed, then curses, threats. And in the midst of hammerings and poundings that frightened Bella half to death, there were screams and groans. As the ruckus raged on, she held down the pot, sick with fear, lest the thing pop out. Only heaven knew what more power it had. She would take no chances in allowing it to get free. At the height of the battle, Bella heard the familiar voice shout, We'll leave to the last man if you give us the ghostly hand. And that's likely, Bella muttered, pressing down so her arms ached for the hand under the pot gave a sudden wild flop. But the girl grinned when she heard Bob ball. This is what I'll give you. Then followed a blast of bullets and screams of pain. In the ensuing silence, limping footsteps dragged. Now George Alderson shouted from overhead, Bella, Bella, are you all right? He leapt downstairs with Bob at his heels. Child, where are you? He kept calling. Are you safe? Never better, Master, Bella called back, though she still shook all over. I'm safe, but please, can Master Bob fetch the parson at once? What in the world? asked the innkeeper, stopping short at sight of the pale girl holding down the pot on the table. It's the ghostly hand, said Bella, nodding toward the overturned pot. It's still now, but I'd best hold on until the parson comes. With the Aldersons about her, Bella related the terrible events of the night. She told of the dreadful things she held captive, of the robber's spell and the burning candle. We'd all be murdered but for you, said Mistress Alderson, embracing the girl. And to show how much he thought of Bella's courage, George Alderson gave her a handsome reward from the store in the cupboard. It's your part of the treasure you saved for us, he said warmly. When the parson came and learned what Bella had done, he called her the bravest lass on the moors. Folks hereabouts won't forget your loyalty and courage, he said. After he'd carried away the ghostly hand, he committed the wretched thing to God's care with prayers of remembrance for the man to whom it belonged. 
And once the parson laid the severed member to rest in holy ground, people say, no one saw the ghostly hand again. To this day, Spital House stands high on Stainmore. On cold nights in October, winds still tear at the ancient tiles on the roof. Rain rattles the window panes. Yet since Bella routed the highwaymen close to 200 years ago, there's never been a robber bold enough to steal treasure from the cupboard of the old hostel.